time now for our usual round of questions. We have a, a large number of uh, questions. I would ask my media colleagues to try to restrict themselves to a single question if they would and keep their questions as short as possible. We'll start with Chris Yorman. <coughs> Prime Minister Chris Yorman from the ABC. Yep. You were trained by Jesuits, so you'd be familiar with a particular exam. Mm -hmm. So, in good conscience, are you the best person to lead this government and prosecute its agenda? And have you considered resigning? Um, yes and no. Yes and no, Chris. Now, let me make it. Let, let me make it absolutely crystal clear. Uh, we were elected in 2013 because the Australian people rejected chaos. That's why we were elected, because the Australian people rejected chaos. And we are not going to take them back to that chaos. We really are not going to take them back to that chaos. Uh, let's also remember uh, what I said time and time again uh, at the time of the uh, Rudd political assassination, at the time of the Gillard political assassination. Sure, uh, party rooms or caucuses choose leaders, but once they've gone to an election, things have changed. It's the people that hire, and frankly, it's the people that should fire. So I am absolutely determined to do what we're elected to do, uh, to clean up Labor's mess, to build a strong and prosperous economy for a safe and secure Australia, and that, I believe, is what my colleagues are equally dedicated to achieving. Stephen Scott. Stephen Scott from the Korea Mail, Prime Minister. You didn't mention the Queensland election in your speech, and I'm just wondering, as an interested observer, what, why do you think the Queensland electorate turned against the LNP so dramatically, and how will you convince your colleagues they don't face the same fate under you? Well, I, I'm not a sophologist, and so I'm not going to try to uh, analyse all the detail of the Queensland election. Uh, obviously, it was a very difficult result, and I feel deeply for Campbell Newman and for his colleagues because they worked hard uh, to make a difference, and I believe they have made a difference. Um, as I said yesterday, so I'm not, in a sense, breaking new ground here, uh, there are lessons in Queensland. Uh, there are lessons in Queensland for all of us. And the fundamental lesson is that if you want to put in place uh, difficult uh, but necessary reform, uh, you've got to explain it, uh, you've got to justify it, and you've got to bring the people with you. Now, I accept uh, that we have done some of that ourselves over the last 12 months. We have attempted to put in place uh, difficult uh, but necessary reform. I know that we've struggled in the Senate. You know that we've struggled in the Senate. Uh, and obviously there are lessons in that for us too. Uh, we do have to make a, a bigger effort uh, with anything that does need to go before the Senate. Most of all, though, we have to make a bigger effort with the Australian people. We have to make a bigger effort uh, with everyone who is involved in decision making. And uh, one of the other things that you'll find in 2015, which is a little different from 2014, is a much more consultative and collegial cabinet process, uh, more meetings of the full ministry, uh, regular meetings between uh, the cabinet uh, and the chairman of the and, and chairs of the backbench uh, policy committees. Um, I believe it's always been, and I did serve for uh, nine years as a minister in the Howard government. I believe it's always been uh, a consultative and collegial government, uh, but it will certainly be the most consultative and the most collegial government this country has ever seen uh, in the weeks and months and years ahead because we are on a journey. We are all on a journey. It's the journey to build a better Australia. It's the only journey worth coming on. Uh, if you are in a position such as mine, it's the journey all of you want our country to make and we have to succeed. We just have to succeed for our country's sake. Laura Tingle. Uh, Laura Tingle from the Financial Review, Prime Minister. Um, you've focused on a stronger economy in your speech and on the need for jobs. Uh, just noticing that there are an extra 63,400 people counted as unemployed since you became elected. I'm just wondering if you could spell out for us how, how you're actually going to address that. And I reference your G20 economic plan, which was built heavily on 
investment in infrastructure, which you also mentioned in your speech. Yeah. How is that affected by the changing balance of uh, assets, uh, asset programs in the states? And will that sort of have a material impact on the uh, uh, economic forecasts? Well, Laura, look, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and you do give me a chance to reiterate the fact that uh, uh, jobs growth was three times as fast in 2014 as it was in 2013. And that's something that I think the government can be pleased about and which all of the small businesses and big businesses out there that have been employing people much more significantly in the last year than they were previously, they can take enormous uh, credit for. So I thank the employers of our country for what they are doing uh, for the people of our country, employing more of them uh, uh, as they have in 2014. On infrastructure, Laura, um, I've said it many times, let me say it again, I would like to be remembered as an infrastructure prime minister. I'm determined to be an infrastructure prime minister. I accept uh, that to achieve that, it's necessary to work with the states and obviously we've had uh, a change in Victoria. Who knows where things will ultimately fall in Queensland. We've had a change in Victoria. And um, can I say to you, uh, the only uh, serious thing to emerge so far from the new government in Victoria is an apparent liability to pay up to $1.2 billion not to build the East West Link. Now, surely it is the very midsummer of madness to pay $1.2 billion not to build a road. I mean, really and truly, really and truly, what does that say about the state of Victoria that they are contemplating paying $1.2 billion not to build a road? Well, you know, uh, we are prepared to spend money. We are prepared to spend money on serious economic infrastructure that will set this country up for the future. Uh, but what Labor does uh, is blow money uh, constantly, and I can't think of anything more crazy than spending $1.2 billion not to build a road, uh, given that the Victorian government's contribution, uh, after the federal government's contribution, uh, after road users' contribution, after the private investors' contribution, was probably only going to be $1.5 billion in the first place. So really, thank you for the question, Laura, because it's a classic example of what goes wrong when, in a fit of absent-mindedness, uh, people elect Labor governments. <laughs> Malcolm Farr. Malcolm Farr from news.com.au, uh, Prime Minister, thanks for your address. Staying with, with jobs, mm -hmm. a, a number of workplace matters have been will be reported on by the Productivity mm -hmm. Commission later in the year. Yeah. But if I could go to your current thinking on one issue, are you aware of or have you read any credible study or research that says lowering or removing the minimum wage creates more jobs? Well, that's not uh, something that this government is interested in. Uh, our position is that we want uh, more jobs and we want better paid jobs. That's what we want. We want more jobs and we want better paid jobs. And uh, in our system, always been the case in the past, uh, is the case now, as far as I am concerned, it will continue to be the case. In our system, there is an umpire. Uh, the umpire, I was the minister responsible once. It was the Australian Industrial Relations Commission then. It's the Fair Work Commission now. Uh, and I support the idea of a fair umpire uh, having the final say over these things. Now, yes, we've got to get the balance right. Uh, yes, we want uh, the Fair Work Commission to be conscious of uh, boosting employment as well as of uh, maintaining wages. Uh, but that's why we've got people in those positions. They're normally people with a lot of experience and uh, let's hope they continue to make good decisions for our workers' sake and our country's sake. Uh, Catherine McGrath. Prime Minister Catherine McGrath from SBS Television. Um, I guess in the hurly-burly of political life, there are peaks and troughs. Uh -huh. I guess fairly this is a trough for you. Um, in terms of economic debate, do you think that as Prime Minister you need to do more to bring the political debate forward in Australia? And do you concede in any way that the skills that brought you to government, the successful tearing down clearly of Labor, 
are not the skills needed and there might be some rebooting there required as well. Well, Catherine, you're asking me to speculate upon myself and uh, I've tried to make it my business uh, in 21 years of public life, including nine years as a minister and uh, four years as an opposition leader and now coming up for a year and a half as prime minister, I've tried to make it my business not to run a commentary on myself. There are people in this room who are paid uh, quite well uh, to run a commentary on politicians and I might ask you to continue to do your job uh, in, in, in that respect. Um, look, uh, our country's been on a journey. Uh, every one of us are on a journey. Uh, and uh, at every stage, we do the best we can. Uh, and I am confident that all of us in this room are more than capable of growing uh, into the various roles that we've got. Andrew Proben. Prime Minister Andrew Proben from the West Australian. Um, dare I say it, I think you contradicted your mentor, John Howard, today when you said that uh, voters had the right to hire and fire Prime Ministers. Mm -hmm. Mr Howard used to say that leadership was a gift of the party room. Mm -hmm. Do you still have the confidence of the party room? And secondly, this is a yes or no uh, question, and perhaps one that was even asked in the pub that you visited. If you were offered a knighthood, <laughs> would you take it? Well, yes and no. <laughs> I think it's highly unlikely that I'm uh, likely to be offered any uh, particular gong just at this time. But uh, can I just say, Andrew, uh, uh, on the visit to the pub in Colac, uh, it was a thrill. Uh, it really was. I mean, uh, uh, one of the downsides of the upside of being Prime Minister is that you don't quite get to move around as freely as you once did. Uh, Margie and I and our uh, families that we've been holidaying uh, for 20 odd years now with, uh, we did get to go down the south coast for um, our annual vacation uh, in the caravan park, but nevertheless you don't get to go out and about as often uh, as Prime Minister as you do uh, as a Member of Parliament or even as a Minister, but it was good uh, to go into that pub in Colac uh, to spend 30 or 40 minutes uh, with the local people, pouring a few beers, uh, chewing the fat. And I have to say, uh, um, uh, I was thrilled with the response. Uh, without dobbing any of them in, I can, I can say that they were warm, they were generous, they were genial, and uh, like Australians everywhere, they want the government to succeed. And, your and, and, and Andrew, on the subject of, uh, of, of knighthoods, uh, I just want to make it clear that uh, all awards in the Order of Australia will henceforth uh, be entirely a matter uh, for the Order of Australia Council. Well, the backbench... Uh, um, is interjection allowed at this gathering? Well, I'll let my book. <laughs> I'm sure Bromwyn Bishop would have dealt very severely with that. Um, look, um, <laughs> Uh, we've had a rough couple of months. I accept that, Andrew. We've had a rough couple of months. Uh, we've had a couple of months where uh, if uh, journalists ring up and uh, ask about some element of government policy, uh, the correct answer, which is I support the government and the policy is a good one, has not always been given. Uh, I accept that we've had a couple of months where if journalists ring up and ask about individuals and personalities in the government, the correct answer, a great person doing a great job, has not been given. I accept all of that. Um, but, you know, when things are difficult, the last thing you want to do is to make your difficulties worse. That's the last thing you want to do, is to make your difficulties worse. Now, uh, I like my colleagues, I respect my colleagues, I trust my colleagues, above all else, to want to do the right thing by themselves, by our party, by the government, and by the country. And the last thing any of them would want to do is to make a difficult situation worse. Mark Riley. Mark Riley, Mr Abbott from the Seven Network. Um, I think you gave a very important commitment in answer to Stephen Scott's question earlier, where, where you said uh, we, you will see the most consultative and collegial government possible in the years ahead, yeah. and I think I've quoted you correctly. Um, Mr Abbott, um, let us remind you that on the 1st of December 2009, when you were elected leader, you said you would be 
do your best to be the uh, a consultative and collegial leader in the uh, election campaign of 2010 on August 16 you said uh, I have said to my colleagues that I'll do my best to be a consultative and collegial leader um, there are many other examples but you can uh, go on if you like I, uh, well, thanks very much I will um, in um, in April 2012 you said we don't want policy unilateralism here and Commonwealth governments of all persuasions have a tendency to policy unilateralism. We want collegiality, we want consultation. In the 2013 election campaign, you said we'll be a consultative, collegial government, no surprises, no excuses. Why have you not kept any of those uh, promises, that promise delivered 12, 15 times to your party thus far? And why should your backbench uh, here today in your cabinet have any faith that you'll keep it this time? Well, Mark, uh very fair question and let me do my best to answer it. Um, I accept that the paid parental leave scheme was a captain's call. Uh, I accept that uh, the restoration of knighthoods was a captain's call. Uh, they are the two captain's calls which I have made, but I have listened, I have learned and I have acted. Uh, I support better paid parental leave, but I accept that this is not the right time for that policy. I accept that, and it's not going to happen. And uh, I accept that uh, I probably overdid it uh, on awards, and that's why, as of today, uh, I make it crystal clear that all awards in the Order of Australia will be wholly and solely the province of the Council of the Order of Australia. So. Uh, I have listened, I have learned, I have acted, uh, and those particular captain's picks, uh, which people have found difficult, have been reversed. Mark Kenny. Mark Kenny from Fairfax Media, Prime Minister. Um, I noticed you used the words that uh, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you simply, was that directed at uh, the Labor Party or did that have some other message to someone else who might, for example, <coughs> have uh, his eyes on the leadership? Look, Mark, that's a, a very cheeky question and obviously, obviously, um, we've already got Bill Shorten saying that if Labor were to be re-elected, the carbon tax comes back. If Labor is to be re-elected, the carbon tax comes back. Uh, Bill Shorten has made that abundantly clear. Um, that's not a rumour. Uh, that's not a leak. Uh, that's a fact, uh, because he said it on the record. Now, if the Australian people want to be spared uh, a $550 a year hit on their budgets, if the Australian people want to be spared a hit on their living standards that will just get worse and worse and worse and worse. With each passing year, they've got to stick with this government. Simple as that. And David Crowe. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, Prime Minister, David Crowe from The Australian. Uh, could I draw you out a little bit on this issue of consultation with mm -hmm. your colleagues? It's a very uh, vexed issue with your colleagues at the moment. You've expressed um, your view on the past mm -hmm. captain's picks. Uh, a lot of your colleagues are unhappy with the ones that you've made. Can you give them an assurance that you won't be making captain's picks again in the future? Well, look, uh, if for argument's sake uh, uh, something like what happened to MH17 were to happen again, I'd call it. Uh, I'd call it an atrocity, an absolute atrocity. Uh, a, a civilian airliner brought down by Russian-backed rebels uh, over what was effectively Russian-held territory using Russian-supplied weapons. Uh, that was a captain's call. It was a true call, it was a brave call, it was the right call for Australia. Uh, you cannot lead without being prepared to call things uh, from time to time. But obviously, uh, as life goes on and time goes by, uh, you work out uh, when you've got to call it yourself uh, when you've got to uh, wait for others. And look, uh, uh, I called it the way I called it. I called it the way I saw it, uh, the morning of that particular atrocity. And then with the National Security Committee of the Cabinet, uh, we worked through every stage of our response uh, to that particular crisis. And uh, 
we did it very well. We did it very collegially, and while nothing can bring those people back, nothing can undo the atrocity, nevertheless, we handled it in ways which added to the strength and luster of our country. Uh, Kerry Yaxley. Prime Minister Kerry Yaxley from the Nine Network. According to opinion polls, your personal popularity has been consistently low. In your opinion, why is that? Why, with all due respect, Prime Minister, do people not seem to like you? Um, well, Kerry, look, uh, uh, I never came into politics to be popular. Um, and anyone who does come into politics to be popular will either be a very bad politician or a very disappointed politician. Um, I came into politics to make a difference, to do the right thing by the people of Australia. Someone has to make the difficult calls, uh, and it is never easy to make the difficult calls. Um, the government uh, has had uh, a degree of difficulty uh, over the last 12 months. I accept that because we've made the right calls, and they've been tough calls. Uh, uh, we did not uh, rush in to offer more bailouts. Uh, to private sector businesses in trouble uh, about 12 months ago. Um, we did not simply accept uh, that it could be business as usual uh, in the budget. Uh, we did challenge the Senate to look at the long-term national interest uh, and not simply uh, to go out and consult the opinion polls. Um, and look, uh, that's been a hard task been a hard task, uh, probably a more difficult task that any other, than any other Australian government has had in recent times. Um, we don't in any way shirk that task, but what I'm saying to you is that we are going to be uh, better, more consultative and more collegial about it this year than we were last year. But uh, we're not going to give up. We're not going to give up because if we do give up, uh, our country runs the risk of succumbing to the European disease. Our country runs the risk of becoming, as I said in my speech, a second-rate country living off its luck. Um, that would be a betrayal, an absolute betrayal uh, of uh, our people and the task that they entrusted to us uh, at the election in September 2013. Michelle Grattan. Michelle Grattan from The Conversation. Mr Abbott, one reason why you've had uh, a degree of difficulty, as you put it, in the last 12 months is that you personally have gone back on a number of commitments that you gave during the campaign. If you lead the government into next year's election, how do you persuade <coughs> the electorate that next time round you will indeed meet the commitments that you give in this campaign? Uh Michelle, I accept that there are some commitments uh, that we gave in the campaign uh, that we have not been able to keep. Uh, but I also say, and I think the public uh, understands this, that the situation that we thought we were facing uh, at the time of the election uh, turned out to be different. For instance, to give you one example, uh, we went into the 2013 campaign with the then government telling us that the deficit for that financial year would be $18 billion. Uh, it turned out that the deficit for that financial year was $48 billion, a dramatic explosion, a $30 billion budget black hole that the Labor Party should have known about, uh, that they created. Uh, they created it. We have had to deal with it. So under those circumstances, there are some commitments. Uh, that had to go, and one which I cite is the commitment that I gave uh, to uh, SBS, Catherine, uh, on the side of Panthers uh, uh, on the last day of the election campaign, no cuts to the ABC, no cuts to SBS. Well, I accept that that hasn't been correct, but you know, when you are looking uh, to restore the budget situation uh, in a context of ongoing debt and deficit stretching out as far as the eye can see because of this mismanagement of your predecessors, and when you are having uh, to ask some sacrifices of the Australian people, how in good conscience, how in good conscience could we not have had a look at the ABC and said there's been no efficiency dividend for almost 20 years? Why of all the organisations in government uh, should the ABC have been freed of efficiency dividends 
uh, for almost two decades, well, yes, it's a commitment, Michelle, that we weren't able to keep. Uh, but I think the Australian public understand uh, that when circumstances change, sometimes uh, governments have got to adjust to those changing circumstances. What they want is a government which is faithful, uh, a government which keeps faith. And uh, I believe that we have well and truly kept faith with the Australian people. Uh, we have stopped the boats. We have scrapped the tar carbon tax. Uh, we have scrapped the mining tax. We are building the roads. And yes, it's a, uh, a work in progress, but we certainly are determined to get the budget back under control. And these were the fundamental commitments. These were the acts of faith we made with the people of Australia at the election. Kieran Gilbert. G'day, Prime Minister. <clears throat> Kieran Gilbert from Sky News. Um, I understand that yesterday you had some conversations with some of your closest, uh, closest supporters and uh, in it you, you basically recognise that you do have a serious threat to your leadership uh, underway and you said, uh, I quote, that in these circumstances you can either panic or you hold your ground and you'll be holding your ground. Is that a recognition that, that you are facing a serious threat to your leadership? And the second question, uh, you met with Julie Bishop last night. Did you ask her for a commitment that she would not challenge you? And if so, what did she say? Well, Kieran, look, uh, I uh, uh, accept that uh, uh, this is a government which has gone through a difficult patch. Uh, all governments go through difficult patches. The Howard government went through many difficult patches. Uh, I can remember John Howard from time to time uh, standing up in the party room and saying things could get worse before they get better. And he said, this will be a test of character. I've said much the same thing myself in the party room uh, on different occasions. This will be a test of character. Now, uh, politicians pass the test when they do what is best for the long term, not when they uh, give in uh, to short-term fear uh, and make a difficult situation worse. Now, um, that's the situation. Um, sure, we've had a bad, a bad patch. Uh, what do you do when you have a bad patch? Uh, you can uh, buckle down to business or not. Uh, but failing to buckle down to business always makes a bad situation worse. So, uh, so that's the conversation that I've had with many of my colleagues. Now, as for Julie, um, Julie's a friend of mine. Uh, Julie's uh, uh, my deputy. Uh, she's been a terrific deputy. She's been a terrific minister. Uh, I believe I have her full support, and I certainly look forward to continuing to have that. Lenore Taylor. Lenore Taylor from Guardian Australia, Prime Minister. Um, two sets of modelling found the impact of last year's budget fell disproportionately on poorer families even after the impact of the carbon tax abolition was taken into account. You've explained very clearly why you think that the budget deficit needs to be tackled, but voters do seem to think that last year's budget was unfair. How do you explain to them your belief, presumably your belief that it was fair, uh, and the choices that you made there? Uh, you know, the, the different and why you didn't take different choices that might have had a different impact on fairness. How long do you per persist with those budget measures from last year that are stuck in the Senate? And what lessons do you take from last year's budget when you come to formulate this year's budget? Well, as for last year's budget measures, uh, uh, they're uh, in the Senate or coming before the Senate and uh, we will deal with them. Uh, in the way we always deal with legislation before the Senate, uh, by courteously and constructively discussing them uh, with the crossbench uh, and indeed the Labor Party, if the Labor Party are interested uh, in being part of the solution rather than simply being the cause of the problem, uh, we will sit down and we will uh, negotiate uh, what we think is the best and fairest outcome uh, that we can get. Now, I am very concerned uh, for fairness. Uh, I wouldn't be in public life if I wasn't very concerned for fairness. But Lenore, what's fair about sa saddling our children and our grandchildren with debt and de deficit as far as the eye can see? Uh, this is intergenerational theft. It's intergenerational theft. Uh, and I've spent uh, plenty of time uh, in recent uh, 
uh, weeks and months and years talking to older Australians, and you know, older Australians have a horror of handing to their kids debt, uh, of saddling their kids with burdens that they had accumulated. Uh, and that's what we're doing. This generation of Australians is blighting the lives of our children and grandchildren because we, under the former Labor government, lacked the intestinal fortitude to address these issues. We were self-indulgent uh, as a nation uh, because of the former Labor government's political weakness. That's what happened. Now, it's our mission. It's the mission of this government to address that. Now, uh, if uh, you don't get it quite right the first time, you have another go, uh, and you get it as right as you can. But we absolutely owe it to the Australian people today and the Australian people of the future to tackle this issue. Um, I think it was Edmund Burke uh, who talked about the social compact as uh, being uh, uh, a, a, uh, um, a kind of a, uh, a trust uh, between those who are dead, those who are living, and those who are yet to be born. We will not break that trust. Prime Minister, we are right on time, but with your indulgence, I will take one final question mm -hmm. from Paul Osborne. Uh, Paul Osborne from Australian Associated <clears throat> Press. Thank you for your speech, Prime Minister. Uh, in your speech, you do mention, um, when you're talking about childcare, that you want to improve the system of multiple payments. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain to the average mum and dad what that would actually mean and doesn't that risk opening a new political battlefront along the same lines as, as Medicare Labor could easily seize on that as attacking family tax benefits? Well, I know that whatever we say or do, Labor will run a scare campaign. I know that. Uh, and Paul, your job, if I may say so, is not to just run the scare campaign. I mean, your job is to hold all politicians and all political parties to the same standard of accountability. Now, uh, uh, what we have in mind will be very much based on the work of the Productivity Commission and the recommendations that the Pro Productivity Commission has made. Uh, and Scott Morrison, uh, the Minister for Social Services, is about to engage on a detailed uh, process of consultation uh, on a detailed uh, piece of work uh, within the next a uh, couple of months, uh, you will see the result. But what we are determined to ensure uh, is that we have uh, a more productive economy, uh, that we have more fulfilled people, uh, that in the end we have better and more prosperous families. Uh, that's what we tr we're trying to build and that's what our childcare initiative will be designed to achieve. And we'll conclude on that point. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister, for uh, your presence here today. Um, this is, in fact, the second time that you've addressed the, the press club uh, since you were elected Prime Minister. But the first National Australia Bank address you did address uh, the club. Uh, you delivered a speech uh, on our 50th anniversary evening, and as you reminded me again today, that was one of the good speeches where you didn't actually have to take questions. Now, uh, thank you for, for coming along today and fronting up for questions. We certainly uh, look forward to the opportunity to. Uh, to see you again, to talk to you again, to, to quiz you again. Uh, and uh, it's virtually midway through your term now, so we hope we don't have to wait until the election for that to occur. We hope we can see you somewhat sooner. So thank you very much, and, uh, and we do look forward to seeing you again.